and that's how she will stay, how she will remain. One friend of mine said, how many people watched that funeral, Dan? And I said, 25 million in this country. And he said, well, that means half the country wasn't watching. What the hell are you doing getting so worked up about it? <laughs> a lot of people weren't in the mail and were really not that affected by it. A princess of Wales I've never really thought that much of her. Slightly screwy, loopy, odd figure. I don't quite see why we have to venerate her now she's dead. She was a shining spirit who will never be forgotten. The orgy of sentimentality was nauseating to behold. A complete suspension of reality by the British people. She became a sort of Christ-like figure. The family this morning, the wife, Diana, the Princess of Wales. I certainly didn't grieve about Diana's death. How can you grieve somebody that you've never met, that you don't know? It's presumptuous and it is, I think, offensive. She'll always be in our thoughts and forever in our hearts. It was like Disney makes the black shirts. You must cry. I couldn't understand what was happening and it frightened me. She's a wonderful person and it's very, very sad. I thought it was chilling and it just seemed to be going on too long and I felt it was about time that it was pointed out that it's our country too. It's still quite difficult to believe what was happening on this very spot this time last year. The surreal events of Diana Week, among other things, altered the whole meaning of this Mao for an entire generation, transforming it from a dignified imperial procession route into a site of raw popular emotion. It's too early, people are fond of saying, to take on board the whole significance of that blazing meteor, or if you must, that brief candle. And of course, nothing could be more British than the belief that something is too soon or premature. Actually, the time is overripe to ask ourselves what was and is the significance of the death of the princess? It was in Paris, capital of the world's first modern republic, that Princess Diana was cruelly and abruptly translated from the banal to the sublime. Having been putting on the Ritz with her jet-set Playboy escort, she got into a car with a hyped-up driver. And after a frantic journey of less than five minutes, her short life was wastefully and pointlessly over. Wasteful, pointless, but meaningless. For millions of people, this accident was no less than a personal trauma. Superficially, the tragedy belongs to the realm of kitsch iconography, like the famous memorial to Jim Morrison in a nearby Paris cemetery. Lives that are cut off too soon, like those of James Dean or JFK, make good iconic material because they can be mourned for what they never became, to say nothing of what they never were. Why will the paparazzi after them? If there was no money, if there was no money in the photographs, they wouldn't have been after her in the tunnel. On the very first morning of the morning, it was plain that the crowd on the Mall had more than grief on its mind. Indeed, there were elements of mob feeling, as well as elements of demagogy, in play. We'll be back with much more from London, but first, this is today, I'm going to see. I have reasons of my own for remembering this feverish moment. Mr. Hitchens, I know that you contend that Princess Diana basked in the media spotlight and, in fact, encouraged much of this publicity. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Um, Princess Diana was a volunteer member of a very controversial ruling dynasty uh, for a brief time. Um, and in that capacity, she deserved and, in fact, I think necessitated uh, a lot of scrutiny. She was also someone who was an assiduous tabloid leaker. It's not the fault of any member of the journalistic profession that her driver went double the speed limit. You believe that the notion that the paparazzi somehow caused this is simply untrue? It's obviously it's self-evidently untrue. Nobody can make a driver double the speed limit in, the, in Paris. I think it's a disgrace for Mr. Hitchens, effectively, to blame Princess Diana for her own death. Did nothing because of the kind. He was, of course, I did not nothing of the kind, Mr. Roberts. That's a very, I also that's think very that cheap. He that's extremely made, cheap. No, absolutely not, Mr. Hitchens. Didn't say it was her fault. I said it was the fault of the driver. If you're going at double the speed... Yeah, no, they were going twice. I, that, I, was, I, was, well, I, I saw that reliably said, and certainly the force of the collision seems to, seems to indicate tremendous velocity. Look, this is a non-issue. What we should be asking about is about what this does to the future of the monarchy.
People have always been magnetized by the actual spot on which celebrity tragedies occur, like the grassy knoll or the shrine to James Dean on Route 66. Here stands the memorial that is actually a replica of the flaming torch on the Statue of Liberty. The slogan on the statue reads, give me your tired, your hungry and your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Now it's been colonized and annexed as a rather tacky, improvised shrine to Our Lady of the Versace. It's France's latest tourist attraction. On the day of the funeral itself, there were observable signs of a photo album cult in formation. There's surely been an interval of sufficient decency for us to learn to distinguish the different types of mourning, which can be conveniently separated into categories. Those who just happened to be there and became part of a shared experience. It's just been a wonderful experience, really, to have been able to be here and share this with the English people. Those who felt they'd been given permission to grieve for an event in their own lives. Those who pegged their own past on her life. Those who lived vicariously through her life. I grew up with Diana, Princess Diana, having scratchbooks and um, coming from Namibia, Southwest Africa. It's like a fairy tale because we don't have princesses. Those who wanted to project their anger and find someone, indeed anyone, to blame. And finally, those who actually worshipped and idolised her and who may believe themselves to be actually in contact. We are all the way from Cameroon. I mean, in back home, everybody was touched. Exploring the different reactions to Diana's death, I began my journey in Wembley with Margaret Tyler, a member of that dying breed, the round-the-clock, uncritical royalist. Unlike Princess Diana, she even likes Prince Charles. Unlike Prince Charles, she adores Princess Diana. Hello, Kristen. Good morning. Nice to see you. Do nice come in. Happy. No, that's all right. This is where I live, Christopher, amongst all this royal memorabilia. Oh, and fantastic corgis. Yes, I had to have that one made. There she is. Yes. This one actually lights up, but this is from the royal wedding. Nice, isn't it? Well, the word radiant gets used, doesn't it? Yes. And this is your consecrated Diana room? Yes. Oh, yes. This carpet she's actually walked on. She has? Yes, it came from the Lanesborough Hotel and she has walked on it. And stained glass, too? Yes. That took a lot of doing, actually. The face did, because I understand faces are very difficult in stained glass. Yeah. Slightly beaky. Yes, the, the just green, a little bit. Powerful green eyes. Yes. <laughs> and this must be one of the princes. Yes, this is Prince William. Yes, that's... Uh, in fact, the lady who made it, she said the Queen saw that um, and said if that had got a voice box, that would be William. Gosh. Yes. Spitting image slippers? Yes, yes. Obviously, I don't wear those now. I don't, you know, it doesn't seem right to wear those. But you used but to I wear used them. to, yes. I used to, but not anymore. It just doesn't seem quite right, does it? Your um, commitment to it seems very authentic. Yes. Did oh, you, yes, it goes back a long way. Did you doubt the sincerity of some of those who went around carrying on that week then? Did you think of them as... Um, <laughs> What, sort of jumping on the wagon yes. or something like that. Um, well, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I mean, th people react in different ways, don't they? But they were they were united, I, um, I think, in their love of Diana. I mean, on the day of the funeral, you tell me somebody who didn't watch the funeral. Uh, you know, there weren't many around, were there? Well, how would you know that? Well, it, I mean, they were just... They certainly everyone. didn't... There were certainly no shots of people not attending the funeral. No, no, no. I mean... And no, there was no, no coverage of people with television switched off. No, no, but I mean, you just knew that even people went on holiday or something, they still watched it in the country they were in, whether it was in a foreign language or not, because they, I think they wanted to be part of it or they wanted to see a little bit of it or they wanted a little bit of her still. But I don't think many people didn't see it. What's your impression of a group of people you haven't met, you know, namely the sort of people who are entirely unmoved? What sort of people do you imagine them to be? Very cold, I think. I think anybody who, who couldn't be moved by that isn't going to be moved by anything very much. And if people didn't want to watch it, then perhaps they're not in the real world. Perhaps they're out of touch or something. I really, I wouldn't mind meeting somebody and asking them, actually, you know, what did you do on that day? Did you sort of just carry on as though it were normal while the rest of the world was mourning? There is another Britain, which was there before the Windsors and will be there after they've gone. This Britain is deceptively mild and understated, but it refuses to be impressed by mere spectacle or overwhelmed by gusts of fashion. It prides itself on not panicking. It is not cold or inhuman, which is why it is not swept away by demagogues, superstars or messiahs. 
Travelling up and down the supposedly United Kingdom, I found it easy to find and meet examples of this other Britain. Brendan Martin from East London wrote a letter contrasting the press coverage given to Diana with a Guardian story about the death of 400 wretched black Haitians buried at the bottom of page 12. He felt that Britain was being brainwashed. I certainly didn't grieve about Diana's death. It would have been absurd for me to grieve about her death. I'd never met her. Insofar as I knew her, I knew her through the media. How can you grieve somebody that you've never met, that you don't know? It's presumptuous and it is, it is I think, offensive. Um, you can grieve somebody who has made a very big difference to your life. Uh, I dare say that South Africa will grieve mightily as most of the world will when Nelson Mandela dies. That will be a grief about somebody who has made a huge difference in the world. But I've never met anybody who could say to me, Diana changed the world in which we live and that's why I'm grieving her. People are expressing their grief right across the country. And it's all testimony to how a young woman won the affection of the entire nation. The BBC got it into its head that there was something called a national mood. And not only that there was such a mood, but they decided what the content of that mood was. What the media were essentially saying was, we all feel like this, don't we? And what I said to myself was, no, I don't. When people turned out and watched the funeral, they were sharing in a national experience. People want to share in experiences like their football team winning the league. This was an opportunity for feeling connected with the rest of your society. But what we were having here was that the price for inclusiveness was this is how you must feel, this is how you must think. And that's kind of sinister and I think rather obscene. At the beginning, the mood was light, it was jolly, and over the, you know, the last couple of hours, it's really changed dramatically. Everyone is just so struck with grief. Many people assumed that everyone felt the same way, but this was not the case. Even though some call-in and feedback shows would not allow profane thoughts on the air that week, a few voices did seep through. This is Talk Radio, the conversation of the nation. Some people might just want to watch Coronation Street. I'd like to see Coronation Street tonight. It might sound selfish, but I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I just don't think it's on. I can't believe people are discussing this the way it is. I mean, she was a silly, trivial woman. You're, you're making her into something that she just wasn't. What and she not, is at the moment, Liz, is dead. Not everybody is interested in the royal family. You know, what, what, what's the nation coming to? I can't believe that people are, are taking this as a personal sorrow. We don't know the woman. She's, she's not like somebody you knew, you know. Would you read what you've said on the card? Well, I've said the card. It's not just what you've done for us that makes us love you so. It's all the joy of who you are that frankly comes to know. Same. Surely there's a distinction between grieving for those you know and those you only think you know. Elizabeth Stern, a reflective musician in South London, had serious thoughts of her own about grief and believed that she knew the real thing when she saw it. I was on the tube and I saw quite a few women, they were all women, um, standing with big bunches of flowers with some um, little cards that were addressed to Diana. And I couldn't understand what they were doing. I couldn't identify with them. And you had a personal reason to relate to the idea of grief? Yes, I did, in that um, my parents were killed in a car accident abroad. So that's as near to a comparable experience as you'd be likely to get. Anyone who suffered a bereavement like me will know. Um, bereavement and mourning is a long-term process that goes on, I think, for the rest of your life, if it's someone that you love and you're close to. These fields of flowers are spreading. Florists are running out of stocks and more blooms are being flown in from Israel. There's also the distinction to be made that people do not send condolence cards, teddies and flowers to the person who's actually died. Um, we received a huge amount of condolence cards and flowers, but they were all addressed to us and to the family and not to my parents. We didn't receive a single card that was addressed to my parents and I just thought it very strange if we had them. I just cannot think that people who thought they were mourning over Diana can possibly say that they were grieving in a way that I understand grief 
and I don't think they were suffering bereavement in the way I suffered a bereavement. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they were suffering, but I'm very sure about that. I didn't really follow much about her in life, but her death has hit me. I can't explain it. <laughs> there were those who felt that they had been given, so to speak, official permission to grieve. It had not before been acceptable to emote in public, and all of a sudden, it was the done thing. Then came those who felt that they had milestones of life in common with the departed, often women who believed that they had shared with her in certain rites of passage. And let's not forget the vindictive, those who sought hoarsely and angrily for someone, indeed anyone, to blame. The man, for example, who assaulted a foreign visitor to these shores for the grave offence of lifting a sacred teddy bear. There are also those who become fascinated by celebrity culture, an addiction that may not be as harmless and silly as it looks, including as it does the habit of vicariously leading other people's lives. One affectation of this cult is the familiar adoption of the adored or famous person's nickname, Gaza, OJ, Diana, or even until her death, Di. What about those who were attracted by mass events and crowd spectacles, including many tourists? People were kicking the paparazzi one minute, but lining up in their thousands to take pictures of the coffin with their instamatics and videos the next. So with the help of a little reflection and examination, it becomes evident that that famous throng of mourners was by no means as unanimous or as monolithic as its media cheerleader would have had you, perhaps I should say us, believe. And come to think of it, why did so many people from day one decide to deliver their posies and bouquets and teddy bears to the wrong address, to Buckingham Palace? It seems to have taken the grief-stricken a little time to accept that their heroine was no longer a member of the royal family, wasn't even an HRH, had in fact been paid a queen's ransom to get lost. 